So we have been spending the last several weeks talking about what it means to be a contagious Christian and how we can develop an infectious faith. And last Sunday, if you'll remember, I talked about Paul's strategy for being contagious, which includes uh, being wise in how we live among unbelievers, being watchful for opportunities to, to spark those spiritual conversations, and being winsome in our interactions so that we leave people with a pleasant and positive impression of Christ. And I hope that these last few weeks you've You've been building more confidence and becoming more comfortable with the idea of discussing your faith outside of church. Still, it's not easy to share your faith, though, is it? I mean, maybe you're just not an extroverted person. Neither am I. Um, maybe you don't know what you're supposed to say or how you're supposed to say it. And, you know, there's always that fear that you're going to be rejected or offend someone. You know, what if it turns into an argument? What if I ruin an otherwise perfectly good friendship? And I wonder if Jesus' followers may have had some of the same concerns running through their minds. You know, they lived under a very strict religious order, and to deviate from the accepted norm was, well, unacceptable. And they must have worried at times about what to say, if they were qualified to say it, and how people might react to them if they did say something. And so one day, Jesus left the synagogues in the city to go teach outdoors. He climbed into this rough, rickety little boat, tied it to a stake and let it drift just a few feet from the shoreline. And soon swarms of people gathered on the beach and just sat in the sand to listen to Jesus teach. And among those listening were, of course, his closest friends, his, his disciples. And I believe that Jesus wanted to give them a bit of comfort and assurance about sharing their faith in him. So he told them this parable that I'm about to read to you. It's found in Luke chapter 8. If you have a Bible or an app on your phone and you want to open up and just kind of follow along as we go, uh, we'll be in Luke chapter 8 most of the morning. So Luke chapter 8, and this story begins in chapter five, or verse 5. I'm sure that it will be familiar to many of you. Jesus says, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Now later, Jesus would take his... 12 apostles and set them aside and, and explain to them the meaning of the seed and the soil in this story. But before we talk about those parts of the parable, we have to talk first about the sower. The sower is the first part of this parable. Jesus begins this story again in verse 5 saying, a sower went out to sow his seed. Now without the sower, there's no story, right? I mean, in fact, even though preachers always tend to focus on the four types of soil, Jesus himself actually calls this in Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. It's about him. So who is the sower? Well, it's Jesus. The story is actually about Christ coming into our world and sharing God's message of love and forgiveness and redemption. It's about Jesus reaching into the hearts of human beings and planting a seed that has the potential to grow into something wonderful. And that's the first thing that we need to understand when it comes to, to witnessing or sharing our faith, outreach, whatever you want to call it. It's all about Him. We don't share a religion or an ideology or philosophy. We share a person. We share Jesus. And even though Jesus is the sower in this story, each one of us who accepts Jesus as our Savior also accepts the responsibility of becoming sowers in his field. Um, we have to be willing to follow in his footsteps and carry on his work. Um, Jesus uses a similar metaphor elsewhere to emphasize the need for us to, to evangelize. He, he says back in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, this is talking about Jesus. It says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, 
teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. So here he is doing exactly what we're talking about us needing to do. He's going from town to town just sharing the gospel message, telling people about the kingdom of God. He's out there sowing seeds in the field, as it were. But then he turns and he talks to his disciples and he tells them in the next couple of verses, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. So when Jesus looked across the landscape of humanity, he saw so much work to be done. So many people to reach out to. But he had so few people working the fields. And the church needs more people who are willing to spread the good news about the kingdom of God like Jesus did. And so Jesus calls us, first of all, to prayer. He says, pray that God will send more workers into the field. But we shouldn't just pray, Lord, send someone. We ought to pray, Lord, send me. Lord, give me the opportunity and the courage to share my faith in you. Use me to make a difference in somebody's life. There's this old hymn that I remember singing a lot growing up, um, sowing the seeds of the kingdom. And I still giggle every time I hear it or sing it because when I was a kid, the line goes, are you sowing the seeds of the kingdom, comma, brother? But whenever I heard it, it sounded like, are you sowing the seeds of the king, dumb brother? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's an awkward break in there when you're singing the song. And so it's every time, still to this day, are you sowing the seeds of the king, dumb brother? Um, but, uh, but the song, that old hymn, asks a, a poignant question. It says, are you sowing the seeds of the kingdom all along the fertile way? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom you must reap at the last great day? To this old hymn reminds us that we're called to be sowers in God's field. Morning, noon, and night, everywhere we go, that's what the song is about, is spreading the gospel to, to every person that we encounter. And it also reminds us that, that if we keep working, if we continue to, to sow those seeds, we'll reap this huge harvest when Christ comes again. And can you imagine being in heaven and people just coming up to you and saying, Thank you for sharing Jesus with me. I wouldn't be here without you. How amazing, how wonderful would that moment be? Okay, so maybe you're willing to follow in Jesus' footsteps and to sow the seeds of faith in the people around you, but you just don't know what to say or how to go about doing it. Well, lucky for us, Jesus tells us when he explains the meaning of the seed. The seed is the next part of there we go, the seed. When Jesus later pulls his disciples aside and explains to them the meaning of the story, he says this in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed that we're supposed to be sowing, that Jesus sows in this story, is, is God's word, the Bible, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. When God's message of love and grace penetrates a fertile heart, time and eternity are forever changed for that person. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said about the gospel? He wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Could you get that next slide for me, Devlin? There we go. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So the gospel is powerful. This, this is why I love, you know, next week, uh, Jeff mentioned, and Ashley, I think, mentioned up here that we're going to be out of town next week. We're going to be going to a comic book convention. We're going to be giving away copies of the comic book gospel that, that we've printed and, and share at, at conventions all over the place. And I, I love handing out these comic book adaptations of the story of Jesus because we're, we're literally placing the gospel in people's hands, and, and we plant a seed that will hopefully take root in their hearts and lives. Of course, I don't always have a comic book gospel to hand out to somebody, and you, know, you probably don't have one in your back pocket either. So we need to be equipped to articulate the message of God's Word. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, anyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. That's good news, right? But 
before people can ask the Lord for help, they must believe in Him. And before they can believe in Him, they must hear about Him. And for them to hear about the Lord, someone must tell them. You and I are that someone. We have to do more than, than hope our friends notice the difference in our lives and figure it out on their own. We have to be able to verbally share the gospel. During Sunday school, for, for those who weren't here, we discussed several ways of sharing the gospel in a clear, concise way. My favorite of these is the bridge illustration, which I've used many times, but we also noted the, the spiritual equation and this judge illustration and this do versus done illustration. And in fact, the, the appendix in the participant's guide, if you have one of those, has several other illustrations to help you communicate the message of Christ. But I want to share one more with you this morning that isn't found in this book. It is, however, found in this book. I think it's the, the easiest way to share the gospel message because it's based on the single most recognizable verse of the Bible, John 3.16. If you know nothing of the Bible, this is the place to start. It's brief enough to memorize in a moment or write on a napkin, and yet powerful enough to touch the hearts of both skeptics and seekers. So here, here's John 3.16, for those who may not be 100% familiar with it. It says, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, starting from this very familiar scripture, we need to highlight four simple points. Number one, God loves. God created the world, and he loves everyone in it. He cares about each one of us, and he wants to spend eternity with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. Number two, God gives. God sent Jesus into our world to live the perfect life that none of us are capable of living, and to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our faults and failures, what the Bible calls sin. Number three, we believe. In response to everything God has done, He simply calls us to believe in Jesus, to put our faith in Him and trust Him to be our forgiver and to be the leader of our lives. And finally, number four, we live. When we put our, our trust and our faith in Jesus, He gives us eternal life. Apart from Him, we perish and die, but through faith in Jesus, we can live forever in His glorious presence. If you can remember John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you can commit that simple verse to memory and remember these four points, God loves, God gives, we believe, we live then you can communicate the heart of the gospel to anyone, anywhere, at any time. It's that simple. Four simple points to make. Remember, though, just because you communicate the gospel clearly doesn't mean everybody's going to receive it. Um, your job is to plant seeds. God is responsible for giving the growth. So there's one last piece to this parable, and that is the soil. The soil is the last and most important part here. Rather than explaining the, the meaning of the soil myself, I'll just let Jesus do it for you. Once he gets his disciples pulled aside and he escapes the crowds, he explains to them, starting in verse 12 of this chapter, the seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, and then, when, then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's Word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. You know, what I get out of this is that there are a whole lot of reasons not to be a follower of Jesus. You know, some people just reject the message of Christ altogether. It never even penetrates their heart. They, they think it's nonsense. Some think that having a relationship with God is a great idea, but they're too shallow to really let God into their hearts. 
others accept the gospel and they embrace Jesus, but the pressures of life and the pursuit of money or entertainment or soccer games or fishing trips are always just a little bit more important and they never give Jesus any room in their life. And if this parable is any indication of real life, then 75% of the time God's word won't take root because the soil just isn't ready for it. But notice that the farmer indiscriminately scattered the seeds on every kind of soil anyway. I mean, no wise farmer, we've got some farmers here, they know you don't just go around throwing seeds and, you know, thorns or on footpaths and stuff like that. That's, that's careless or wasteful or stupid. Well, it would be if you had a limited amount of seed. But we have an unlimited amount. The message of Christ can be shared over and over and over again and will never run out. I think that this sower knew that some of this soil, in fact most of this soil, would be unproductive. But in order to get the best possible coverage, he just willingly and liberally scattered the seed on it anyway. And just like that sower, God allows his words and his love to fall on many who won't receive it. He wants everyone to have the opportunity to hear the gospel and accept Jesus. And Christians, you know, we sometimes pull back from those who, who seem indifferent or uninterested, but God doesn't. In God's eyes, he'd rather be rejected three out of four times than to miss the one person who might embrace him. And even though God's message to humanity will meet rejection more often than not, there are still, as Jesus said, honest, good-hearted people who will listen, who are eager to hear about God's love and willing to put their faith in Jesus. According to a study by Barna Research, 25% of unchurched Americans, those who don't go to church at all, say that they would be very likely, not just likely, but very likely, to attend church if a friend invited them. Think about that. That's one out of four of your unchurched friends who would be willing to come to church with you if you just invited them. Not at the invitation of you know, some radio station or some preacher or some stranger, but a friend, then they would come. When we become committed to sowing the seeds of God's word, we'll begin to see a huge harvest. So what seeds have you been planting? What, who do you know that you could share God's message with? There's good soil out there. We just have to keep spreading those seeds in order to find it. I hope that this series has helped you view the people in your life through the eyes of Jesus. And I hope that you've been praying, you know, seeking God and asking him to use you and, and re to, to reach a bent and broken world. And I hope that you get to experience what it's like to live on the evangelistic edge, to truly become a contagious Christian and bring more and more people into the kingdom of God. If you're here today and you're not a Christian already... If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, I hope that you can see that we really care about you and your spiritual journey and your eternal destiny. God loves you. He sent Jesus, his son, to pay the penalty for your sins. He invites you to believe in him, to just trust him to be your savior and forgiver. And when you do, you receive that amazing gift of eternal life. And I'd love to talk with you if you have questions about God or Jesus or the Bible. And you can feel free to, to pull me aside after church here or just call me at home. My phone number's on the back of the bulletin. In the meantime, though, let's just stand and sing and praise God together. Let's sing, church.